You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the heart of Fiat Crucified Love. I finally got around to doing this podcast. I've planned it for weeks and my mom fell and ended up in the hospital. We had all sorts of things happen and I wasn't able to record it. So I'm happy that I get to do this today. Let me scooch it a little bit closer. Right. I don't know, but we're going to go. <laughs> Our podcast this week um, is going to be on the theology of manners and the virtue of being polite. So often people think that the question of being polite um, is a human virtue, right? Just like something that makes you a better person. And there's actually um, a moral question um, when it comes to being respectable and polite to people. I don't know how this is going to work. Um, and we're going to talk about that from scripture, from the saints, because in our world today, people are very rude. Um, and St. Paul says that love isn't rude, right? In 1 Corinthians 13, he says, love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, and love is not rude. Um, so if one is lacking in politeness, then they're lacking in charity. And it's a vice that needs to be confessed and remedied um, to render the soul perfect like Christ in love, to be able to go to heaven. Um, and I think that, you know, this vice stares me in the face because I was raised in an extremely polite home. And I remember, you know, there was a large family and we didn't always have a lot, right? My dad worked very hard for what we had. But my mom read Miss Manners and she said, just because we don't have a lot of money doesn't mean that um, we can't live with manners, right? And so... Um, it's very beautiful to teach children of every socioeconomic class um, the virtue of being cultured, of being ladies and gentlemen in a world um, where that's been lost. So let us say a prayer to the Holy Spirit. And um, the song that we'll sing is just give thanks, right? Being thankful is actually... Um, a virtue of being polite to remember to thank people, whether it be, you know, for a gift or writing a thank you note, um, acknowledging when somebody sends you a card or um, comes to your home for your birthday with something, right? I was raised always writing thank you notes and um, people forget to acknowledge generosity and to be grateful for it. In fact, unfortunately, sometimes people even um, good people spit the giver in the face, right? And reject that gift. And um, that's selfish and it's a vice. So we're going to sing a song about being thankful first to God and then to each other. And then we'll talk about the different, um, the different aspects of being polite and where they can be found in scripture and how we can grow in that virtue um, in the world. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, live, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we will be recreated and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Because he's given Jesus 
was Christ, his son. And now, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the love of God has done. And now, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for us. Give Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia. I haven't sung that song in English in a really long time. We sing it often in Russian. So I had to, as we started, because I never have time to practice, I had to remember how to do it in English and the words because they come to me in, in Russian. We are going to talk about the virtue of being polite, right? St. Paul says, love is not rude. So if you want to be a charitable person, then you have to be polite. You may not be rude to people. And once again, um, in First Peter, it's written, finally be of one mind, having compassion one of another, loving each other as brothers, being pitiful and being courteous. So St. Peter is commanding the people that he's speaking to to be of one mind and to be compassionate, right? So part of that is um, being polite, um, being forgiving, um, being generous, being grateful, right? So say somebody gives you a gift that you already have, right? If you're compassionate, you don't say anything. You're, you see that the gift is the love they had in their heart to give you something, right? So you accept it graciously. Um, to truly love each other, to not be competitive, jealous, or judgmental, but to love selflessly from the heart. To be pitiful is to be compassionate, right? To feel another's... Um, emotions, their happiness with them in your heart and their sorrows in your heart, and to be courteous. So 
So it's even scriptural that we're not allowed to be rude and that we're called to be courteous, right? Many um, saints have highlighted the importance of being polite. Um, and sometimes they highlighted just the politeness of being kind, right? If somebody's kind, then they're always polite. It's almost interchangeable, right? Um, St. Therese of Lisieux wrote in her diary, The Story of a Soul, kindness is my only guiding star. So being polite and kind and courteous to people was her only guiding star. It made her not only a great saint, but a doctor of the church. Being kind, right? In its light, I sail a straight route. I have my motto written on my sail, to live in love. So for St. Therese of Lisieux, it was interchangeable to be polite, to be kind, and to be charitable, right? Those things should all be together. Mother Teresa also said, let us more and more insist on trying to raise the funds of love, of kindness, of understanding, and of peace. Money will come if we seek first the kingdom of God. The rest will be given. So she said, even if you're in a mission and you're struggling to make ends meet or to provide for people's needs, that you still shouldn't worry about those practical things. But instead, you should try to increase the charity of your heart, the kindness, the politeness and courteousness that you show other people. St. Basil the Great also preached very often on kindness. One of my favorite quotes is, a tree is known by its fruit, a man by his deeds. A good deed is never lost. He who sows courtesy reaps friendship, and he who plants kindness gathers love. If you're courteous and polite to people, then you'll end up having friendships, right? If you're rude, then people won't want to have you around except for selfish gain of another type, right? And he interchanged courteousness and kindness, right? And that by being courteous and kind, we have friendship and love with people. Padre Pio wrote in a letter, you need to hold fast to two virtues, kindness toward your neighbor and humility toward God. You will only be kind to your neighbor if you're humble before God. If you're haughty or you're proud, then you put yourself above your neighbor. You look down on him and you don't take the time to be polite, right? And to be um, conscientious of them, to be kind. But if you are humble before God, if you know your place before him, then you allow the kindness that God has to flow on through you to those around you. And maybe the most direct quote that I've ever found on this topic was by St. Jean Baptiste de La Salle. He says, it's surprising that most Christians look upon decorum and politeness as merely human and worldly qualities, that they do not think of raising their minds to any higher views by considering politeness as a virtue that has reference to God, to their neighbor, and to themselves. This illustrates very well how little true Christianity is found in the world, how few among those who live in the world are guided by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Still, it is this Spirit alone which ought to inspire all our actions, making them holy and agreeable to God. So he was saying, in essence, that where there's rudeness and impoliteness, there's a lack of charity, and that's vice. It's a lack of true Christianity. So what are the different ways that we can live out politeness, right? Saying please, saying thank you, saying excuse me, saying I'm sorry, right? When you've done something wrong, forgiving, to make reparation for sin to answer people 
Maybe it's a text, maybe it's a phone call, maybe it's an invitation to not ghost people, right? So often people do that in today's world. To speak and to live with dignity and to show obeisance, I right? just learned that word, obeisance to strangers. I'd never heard that before. But it's a spiritual hospitality or deferential respect to your visitors, right? The people coming to your home. So let's discuss some of this. The first is um, thanks. And you know, I know somewhere in here, I have a lot of quotes. I think I forgot to I put that under speaking and living with dignity, speaking not only in a holy way, but in gratitude. But my, my mind and my heart is drawn to the um, story of Jesus healing the 10 lepers. And he pointed out only one of them came back to give thanks, right? And any time that he ate with his apostles, whether it be in the resurrection, whether it be multiplying the loaves and the fish, <coughs> It says that he, you know, he took the bread and he gave thanks to his father. Jesus was always thanking his father. He, when he would pray, he'd say, Father, I thank you who are in heaven. I thank you for hearing me. I thank you for your glory, for your goodness. So Jesus himself always was grateful. And you can look to at his reaction to people who gave him gifts in the gospel. Jesus was God. He needed nothing. And yet he never looked down upon those who offered him something. In fact, that little boy offered him five loaves and two fish. He could have said, what good is this for all these people, right? Or he could have said, I'm God. I can make, you know, bread out of rocks. But instead he was grateful to this gift and he multiplied the love of the little boy so that all the thousands of people could eat. When the sinner woman came to him to wash his feet and anoint them with oil, he didn't spurn her and say, you're impure, don't touch me. Or I don't want your gift. You might have a wrong intention in giving me it. You're too attached to me, leave. Instead, he was grateful. He saw her heart that was seeking to love and seeking to honor God, that was seeking a friendship with him. And he not only accepted her gift, he defended her against those who looked down on, on her for doing that. You know, um, when Zacchaeus came down from the tree and Jesus went to his home, what did he say to Christ? I offer you everything. I will repay the poor, you know, times over what I have extorted from them. That was a gift to Christ. Jesus could have said, well, no, I forgive you. Just go and sin no more. He didn't. He allowed Zacchaeus to be excess in his answer and his gift. When Jesus was invited to Mary and Martha and Lazarus's home, he accepted their hospitality. And yes, he drew the focus on to Mary Magdalene's love, right? As being more important than the work being done, but he was grateful for what Martha would do. And it said in scripture that Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He had a friendship with them and he accepted their hospitality. He was grateful and we're called to be grateful. We're called to, um, to be respectful of other people's gifts to us. You know, very often, um, People will invite you somewhere, right? To a party, maybe you don't want to go. And it says on there like RSVP. People don't ever answer RSVPs, right? They don't want to be bound to something. Immediately, my mind is, is drawn to that parable Jesus told of the wedding feast and inviting people and they rejected his invitation and he went out and sought others. But the rejection of his invitation or the fact that they just didn't show up right? Even with the parable of the virgins waiting for the bridegroom, the ones who ran out of oil, who weren't prepared, those who came to the wedding feast in an improper way of dress, those were all things that Christ presented as bad things that were not to imitate. 
So when we receive invitations, there's a, a very small moral responsibility to answer them to an RSVP. It's not moral because you owe somebody an explanation, but it's moral because you owe somebody respect and love when they invite you somewhere. And so it's the lack of love in not answering that Christ would condemn. Because basically by, by ignoring an invitation or um, ignoring a gift, not writing a thank you, not acknowledging it, or unfortunately sometimes people spit in your face when you give them a gift, then that just shows a lack of charity in your heart. You're not respecting the love of the person inviting or giving. And so that's a vice, right? It's a lack of charity. You know, and Jesus sets the example of the importance of answering people, not ghosting them, not ignoring them, not blowing them off because you don't have time, right? And he um, gives us an example of God as our model. I think about that passage um, where he talks about... It's from Luke here. Here it is. Suppose one of you is a friend to whom he goes at midnight and says, friend, let, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived at my house from a journey. I have nothing to offer him. And he says in reply from within, don't bother me. The door has already been locked. My children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, if he does not get up to give him the loaves because of his friendship, he'll do it because of his persistence, right? And then he says, I tell you, saying like, my father is even better than this. Ask and you'll receive. It doesn't say ask and you'll be ignored. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds and the one who knocks the door will be opened. What father among you would hand his son a snake when he asks for a fish or hand him a scorpion when he asks for an egg? If you then who are wicked know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So he's setting the Father who actually responds as our model. So we want to be careful about ignoring people, right? Because when we do that, especially not maybe if you forget something, but if you purposefully just don't recognize a gift or ignore an invitation, Right? Or say, I'm not going to that person's house. Why? Because I don't like them. Well, that's a lack of charity and it's a vice. And there is a moral um, quality of that that needs to be remedied by confession and a, and a change of life so that our charity can match Christ's, so that our love will not be rude. Right? Um, you know, and in Philippians, we see again how God answers people. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. I say again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If you ask and you present it to God, he'll answer you right? God never ignores us. So we don't really have an excuse to ever ignore people. Colossians, conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making most of the opportunity. Let your speech be with grace and seasoned with salt so that you know how you should respond to each person. It doesn't say sometimes you won't respond to people. It says not only are we called to respond to people, but we're called to do it with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, to put heart into it, to infuse our responses with charity, right? It doesn't mean that when you're invited somewhere, you owe a person an explanation as to why you can't come. There are private things in our life, right? But you do owe them a response. That's one of kindness and one that if it's infused with love, will give them peace, right? Another, you know, way of, um, of courteousness that we're called to live is to learn to use that word, I'm sorry, right? To recognize in humility when we've offended someone 
and to apologize, like verbally, to actually go up and say, I'm sorry, I misjudged you. I'm sorry, I was rude to you five years ago, right? I'm sorry that I, you know, betrayed you. I'm sorry that I was so unkind or that I made a mistake or I offended you, you know? And there's also um, a responsibility to make up in reparation for the way that we offend people. In fact, the catechism says that. Catechism, paragraph 2487 says, every offense committed against justice and truth entails the duty of reparation, even if its author has been forgiven. So if you lie about someone and you go to confession, it's forgiven, but you have a moral responsibility to make up reparation, to go back to the person you lied to and say, you know what, that wasn't true. To go to the person you lied about and instead of being embarrassed and ignoring them or treating them as lesser or unimportant, pretending like you don't know them, to reach out in kindness, right? When it's po impossible publicly to make reparation for a wrong, it must be made secretly. Maybe, you know, it wouldn't do good to go and to announce to a whole family that you lied about their child or their sibling. But you do owe it to go to that person and secretly say, I'm sorry, I'd like to make this up to you. If someone who has suffered harm cannot be directly compensated, he must be given moral satisfaction in the name of charity. The duty of reparation concerns offenses against another's reputation as well. The reparation, moral and sometimes material, must be evaluated in terms of the extent of the damage inflicted, and it obliges one's conscience. If you lie about someone, you may even owe them material help. You lie about someone and you destroy their business. You probably owe them some financial help to get it going. You lie about someone, you destroy their vocation, their relationship with their family. They no longer have the donations that they needed, right? Sometimes people lie about different, you know, missions or things run because they're jealous. Well, then you have to make that up to them. And paragraph 19, 1491, the sacrament of penance as a whole, consisting in three actions of the penitent and the priest's absolution. The penitent's acts are repentance, confession of the sin to the priest, and the intention to make reparation or do works of reparation. So these are not just reparation to God, but if you steal money from someone, you must repair that money and return it to them, right? There's many different ways of, um, of making reparation. You could have destroyed a friendship. Well, you gotta try to help those people to be healed in that relationship, right? Maybe you help someone with an abortion. Well, then you owe them you know, help in the healing and finding them um, places to go to heal their hearts. And if they end up pregnant again, helping them with that baby. You know, maybe donating to pro-life missions. But it's not just polite and courteous. It's a moral obligation that your um, act of apologizing have concrete um, reparation behind it and concrete words. And we're also called to forgive, right? Um, this isn't something we can just demand. It is um, part of not being rude is forgiving people, recognizing nobody's perfect. And how many times? Well, Jesus told Peter 70 times seven, right? Um, he says, you know, if you find yourself presenting a gift to the Lord and you remember you have a grievance against someone, leave the altar and go to that person and apologize or forgive them you know, heal that relationship before you come back and offer me something. And Jesus on the cross gives the greatest example of this. He says, um, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He prays for those who've hurt them. And we're called to do that as well. And when you pray for those who have hurt you, 
or those maybe you've hurt, your heart becomes gentle. Your heart becomes kind. And then when you encounter people, you'll be living um, the purity of charity in a more full way. And naturally from that, you'll be kind and polite and courteous. You won't be rude, right? A heart full of love is not rude. You know, manners isn't just like knowing where your fork goes in a place setting. That's that's nice, right? And it's like a social thing. And I think we should teach children how to set a table and, you know, different things like that. But I think that that idea of being polite and kind and not rude goes to the heart, right? It's the way that we treat people. And so more important are what words you speak around that dinner table. That you're not, you're careful not to be um, judgmental or gossiping or calumnous um, or complaining or negative, right? Those are rude things. Um, you always want to be a sower of peace with your words and to have them be filled with a spirit of thanksgiving. If you practice every day thanking God for the different gifts that he gives you, um, finding the good in difficult situations and thanking him for it, then um, you'll always be positive, right? Um, Walt Whitman has a quote that I have on my wall in my kitchen. If you keep your eyes toward the sunshine, shadows fall behind you. So no matter what's happening, if you keep your eyes on the Lord, who's the light of the world, then all that is negative or shadowy will fall behind you and it will dissipate. And... Another um, aspect that we're called um, is has to do with our speech. And, you know, when I'm with children, I've spent years now, you know, my whole life has been with children and orphanages and nieces and nephews and things. But now um, I'm a nanny um, for high profile families the last, you know, seven years or so. And um, maybe a little bit less. Oh, about seven years. And... Um, I have to, it's not just taking care of children, but you're teaching them etiquette. You're teaching them moral principles of how to live. You're educating their mind and their soul at all times, right? And you're helping them so that they can enter into society and be Christ-centered, loving people who are ladies and gentlemen, who are respectable and, you know, to other people and to themselves and to God. And so um, a word that I find myself using with children very often um, that I'm helping uh, is the word dignity. Because um, it, sometimes with a child, you have to state something for them to learn it. And so, you know, to teach a child manners is to teach them that they were created in the image and likeness of God as a child of God. And that they're called to live with dignity. And that that means being respectable in the way that you treat other people with your body and what you allow in your body. Um, and in your speech, to speak with dignity, right? So I often say, you know, God made your body with dignity. And so you have to respect it and be modest. You can't just run around naked in front of all the workmen, right? It's not modest. Um, crass jokes, you know, um, are, are nothing that is actually funny. It's disrespectful to the human body. So we shouldn't make jokes like that, um, with gestures or, or in reference to our body. Um, the way that you treat your siblings is supposed to be a dignity. So if you're a little boy, God gave you a strong body so that you can use it to help mommy or to serve people, to protect your sister. You're not supposed to use your body to hurt someone, right? You use it to help them and to serve them. You use your body with dignity. And um, in your speech, right? You have to speak to people with dignity. You don't call names. You don't say bad thing, bad words, right? You don't say disrespectful things that someday when you die, Jesus is going to say to you, how did you use that body that I gave you? Did you use it to love or did you use it to hurt people? Did you treasure it and protect it with modest clothing or did you spoil it? 
How did you use those eyes I gave you? Did you look at pure and holy and beautiful things? Or did you look at evil? How did you use the ears I gave you? Did you listen to bad things? Or did you, you know, only listen to what would uplift the heart? How did you use that mouth I gave you? Did you speak polite words of kindness and love? Or did you, you know, speak things that would hurt another person? So, you know, that word dignity has become very, um, very important in the way that I help children understand vice, right? Um, and it's interesting, you can call a child to that next level just by referring to them as a lady or a gentleman, right? Ladies don't do that, right? Or are you acting like a gentleman? It's just that language can call them. But then also that our words need to be filled with what is true and good and holy, that they need to glorify God, that they need to be full of thanksgiving, right? And praise. And scripture even says in a few places that we are supposed to speak in songs and hymns and, um, you know, praises of joy to the Father. Imagine if that's what everyone used their mouth for, right? It would raise society to a level where speech would really glorify God. And that naturally is polite, right? It's courteous, it's kind, and it's life-giving because it respects the dignity of the human person. In 1 Thessalonians, it says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So not only with our mouths should we be thankful, but in our attitude, right? Maybe you have somebody who cleans your home and you don't feel like they do a good enough job sometimes. You can point out what they've done wrong, but instead of talking bad about them or demeaning them or talking down to them, maybe see something that they actually do really well and compliment it, right? So instead of seeing a piece of dust in the corner of the living room, why don't you say, you know, thank you so much for, you know, staying the extra 10 minutes every Friday to make sure that the refrigerator is cleaned out, right? It's, it's using your speech to give life. And it, Philippians says not to be a grumbler. St. Paul says do all things without grumbling or questioning. We shouldn't use our, our speech to grumble or complain. Colossians says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. If you have thankfulness in your heart to God at all times, you'll be polite because that kind of guards charity within your heart. And the fruit of charity is being well-mannered, right? Ephesians also says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks for the things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and to God the Father. So it's the same thing. Psalm 107, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. And, you know, another aspect of your speech that I think of right now as we're, you know, going through this is the idea of not interrupting and that, that charism of having a listening heart. It's rude to interrupt people, to cut them off, to correct them. Even sometimes their facts might be wrong. But if it's not said to the right person at the right time in love because it's important, then it just demeans their character. There's no reason that, you know, a husband and wife have to correct the details of, you know, their lunch encounter if it's not really important. Like if somebody's speaking heresy, yeah, you might have to correct them. But if one says it was roast beef at lunch and it was really pulled pork and it looked like roast beef, there's no reason to correct that right? That's not loving the person. It's loving a fact more than a person. And when somebody's trying to express themselves and they get interrupted, unless there's an emergency, it's rude, right? Or to talk incessantly and not listen to the person in the conversation, that's also rude. 
So we want to pray for the gift of wisdom, which is a listening heart. And by listening to God as we speak, we speak words that glorify him and we have a spirit of silence that brings peace to people as we listen to them, right? Um, you know, pride can enter in a conversation when people only talk about themselves. Um, and that's rude. We're called not to be rude. But when you are selfless and you ask a 15 year old niece about their soccer program and you're not interested at all in it, but you want them to feel loved, that's, that's politeness and that's a form of charity. In general, um, we're supposed to think about and speak about holy things, right? And then naturally we won't say anything crude or rude or, you know, disarming to someone. Philippians says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things, speak about these things. And Isaiah says, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the people, make them remember that his name is exalted. Praise the Lord in song. He has done glorious things. Let this be known throughout the work, world. If your words are full of thanksgiving to the Lord, proclaiming his glory, they can never be rude. Again, in Psalm 95, it says, Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us joy shout joyfully to him with psalms. Imagine if praises of God filled our speech, how much peace would be in the world. And it's not just about what you're proclaiming to the people around you, but, um, and it's, it purifies your conversation if you have, you know, praising God as a center purpose of it. But in itself, that praise and thanksgiving given to God, that spirit of gratitude, um, is being polite to God. It's giving him his just due. Colossians speaks about the importance of being polite, saying, Holy and beloved, elect of God, put on tender mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. If above all you're seeking love, then you'll never be rude. You'll always be courteous. You'll always be grateful to God and to other people. And you'll respect the dignity of, of um, their person and their choice to love you, right? In Titus, it says, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey and be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, and showing humility to all men. You know, showing a deference or a respect to an authority, even if you don't agree with them, is polite. And it's something that in scripture that we are commanded to do, right? You might not like the president because he murders babies all the time. You don't have to like it. He's wrong. He's constantly committing scandal and mortal sin. But if you meet him, you're not allowed to be rude. And rudeness doesn't convert people, even the hardest of sinners. Love and mercy does, right? Jesus converted sinners by showing them mercy and love. And in Thessalonians, the second Thessalonians, it says, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example because we did not act in an undisciplined or an impolite manner among you. Nor did we eat anybody's bread without paying for it. They didn't like steal people's food or, you know, try to loaf off of other people without doing anything themselves, right? But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so we would not be a burden to anyone. Not because we did not have the right to it, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so you would follow our example. Laziness is rude. So yes, there are missions where people donate to the food of the missionary so that the missionary doesn't have to work. They can spend time running a soup kitchen for other people, right? But if you expect people to, you know, sometimes 
I've lived on divine providence in a good and holy way where people provided things for me, but then I made sure that I gave more than I received, right? And that I used that freedom of not having to work solely for others and the good building up of the church. But you sometimes have people who say they'll live off of divine providence and they're sitting at home, you know, twiddling their thumbs, watching TV, hoping somebody else pays for, you know, their child's dinner that night. That's laziness and that's rude. There's no charity in that, right? So there is something positive about God's providence providing for us, but it's alongside our labor of prayer and work, right? And then here at the end, the last one that I just want to mention is that obeisance to strangers, showing hospitality and differential respect to those who come into your home or to your little area. You know, doing something kind for your parish priest, um, bringing them bread, bringing them a meal if they're ill, inviting them to your home, right? Um, if there is an elderly neighbor that lost her husband, inviting them for Thanksgiving. When people come, asking them what they'd like to drink. Maybe you can't afford really expensive things, but you can always afford a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, a, a glass of water, right? To kind of also try to remember what people like. Oh, you know, Miss Jones always drinks cream in her coffee when she comes, you know, and so trying to have that available. Um, but scripture talks about this in Genesis. It says, when Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, he saw three men standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them. He bowed himself to the earth and he, he fed them. He showed great hospitality. Um, and when the angels came to Lot in Sodom, it says two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them. He bowed down his face to the ground. He was hospitable. In Exodus, it also says that you should honor. Um, oh, that's, I'm sorry, that's a different topic. That's honoring your parents, right? That's also an aspect of being polite. Exodus says, honor your father and mother. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Um, so it doesn't matter if you disagree with them or they seem annoying in their old age. All people who age um, uh, can be a little more needy or difficult for younger people to deal with. And you'll be the same way. I'll be the same way. We are to show honor and love and generosity and greater forgiveness and endurance and care for the elderly than for anyone else, especially if they're our parents. Um, and Leviticus says, you shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of the old man and you shall fear your God. That you should show respect when you're serving at a table. You always give the first portion of the pizza, of the cake to the oldest to the parent, right? To make sure you're honoring them and respecting them. And in general, we look to the letters of Paul as to what being polite means, encompassing charity. Romans says, love one another with brotherly affection and outdo one another in showing honor. We're just called to honor and respect people at all times. In Ephesians, he says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Only such is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And in 1 Corinthians, it says, if one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any questions on grounds of conscience. It's rude to reject the food presented to you, you know, unless you have an allergy or it will make you sick, right? But, um, you're always called to try to receive the gifts that people give you in goodwill, right? And in Corinthians, it also says all things should be done decently and in order. All things should be done politely, courteously, with respect and with love. So it's just kind of a few things for people to think about this week. Um, the morality of being polite, of showing manners to people. Um, and maybe we can pray that these virtues may be lived in the world more because people are very rude in the world. Um, and a lack of manners is a lack of charity. Love isn't rude. 
So glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Alleluia. God bless you. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.